Okay, continuing my critical let's play of Modern Warfare 3. So we captured Volk, and hopefully he has some information on, um, what's that guy's name? Makarov, that guy. Um, we saw his loading screen at the end of the last mission episode, so we can skip it. Kind of mention how weird it is to have a president talking to us. What's their status? They have so we're still with these characters, you know, we're clearly not where we first captured Volk. We've moved on somewhere, but we're still with Frost, we're trying to get Volk out of here. Um, he was there somewhere, I can't see him now. Uh, still in Paris. But then like we start with that character then almost instantly we go up into this gunship. Um, I'm trying to see Paris down. So this is kind of like a gunship level from Modern Warfare 1. Um, except you have this kind of... You can use the black and white stuff but you don't have to use it. The black and white screen. And you're not kind of locked into different zooms with different weapons like you were in the other one. Um, So we have this kind of, you know, and interestingly, so the gunship is in its own mission. It's, it's, um, you know, just kind of, we just dart back and forward between the two. Solid copy, but any kind of, um, harrowing, uh, sorry, I'm getting distracted. Any kind of harrowing horror of mediated war is kind of lost with this lack of black and whiteness. But we've kind of already realized how this game isn't really interested in, in that kind of actual war kind of thing. I think a jet just came through a napalm, yeah. It is kind of interesting being able to see this like massive battlefield from up high. Like there's, unlike the previous gunship levels, there's a lot of stuff going on. So I'm being told I'm not allowed to fire on buildings. You also got these black squares around people, which makes it a lot easier to hit them, like, they're not even really people. But you still have that same kind of force rotating movement. You know, one of those characters is Frost, you know, is us, really, which is, you know, that kind of swapping back and forth of perspective thing happening again. And they're dropping purple smoke just like we were dropping as Frost. Building on that letter shoot. And then you get this kind of video up in the side of one of somebody's helmet cam. So just kind of at the same time over one screen, you have these two different embodied perspectives at once, which I find really cool. You know, it's probably Sandman, not Frost, but you kind of have who you are on the ground and who you are on the sky, both are visible at the same time. So we're not meant to engage with buildings, but we've just been told we're allowed to. So again, kind of like the gunship mission in the first one, that kind of casual chatter about what we're allowed to do. But now, unlike in the first game, you know, we come under attack because this is a full-on battlefield. So a missile locked onto us and now we're kind of spiraling in circles. So we had to get out, so then like the camera just kind of follows um, for one last shot of a gun she gets to do before they leave back down to our men on the floor who uh, have gone inside while we were trying to get rid of that missile. And now, you know, we just kind of have this flow back to the action of the ground after the action of the air. Um, I find that like moment where the camera just follows the bullet down into the ground super interesting as as a transition back to this body from that body. Um, it's a very interesting way to do it, I think. 
because there's not because there's very few times your games actually have to move from one body to another without a loading screen. So um, it's interesting how they found ways to do that. I imagine it was probably an issue for a while. Like, how do we go from this one body in the air to a body in the ground um, seamlessly? And following the aerial bodies, ammunition downs is, is a quite a fluid way to do it. So now we have no air support and we're kind of working through this square on ourselves. And if you might have noticed from the gunship, you can look down and you can actually see this square with that circular thing in the middle. So Grinch still has Volk on him. You really get to see him because we're constantly pushing forward, but we're reminded he's there. Didn't think I was that close to dead. You can see down there, I'll look at it closer up. There was a car with a flame animated background, so the flames are being sucked into it. Um, I get really fascinated by that glitch, and it al always happens. Um, it's not just a one-off thing. Every time I've done played through the campaign, that one car's fire is going backwards. I'm excited to finally have it on film. <laughs> So I try to explain it to people and I don't think anyone knows what I'm talking about. Don't know if you noticed, but part of the balcony just got destroyed by a stray bullet. Um, but it wasn't my bullet. Kind of like that, all these kind of flashing lights going everywhere. Are actual bullets by actual people being fired. Um, Other NPCs fighting other NPCs might just happen to, oh dear, you know, take out, you know, cause more bullet holes. Anyway, there's a fire going backwards. So the gunship came back just in time. And then we shoot back up into the air. The kind of reverse of the, you know, the shot coming down. So this allows us to kind of, instead of doing just another vehicle extraction, um, which we've already done, no shortage of times before, now we get to defend our characters from the air while they do their vehicle extraction. You know, as opposed to being there ourselves, we can be out there. And again, we have that kind of perspective of a corner of them. And you know, you can hear them talking to each other. I really like just the height of this gunship, you know, you get to see the entire battlefield, including the aerial battlefield. Just kind of jets going and everything. God, reload. Oh, I just sunk a boat in the ocean. I did not know I could do that. Pick those birds 
Let's have the Eiffel Tower there. Um, you know, and now we're going back down to the ground using the same transition with our one final shot. Um, the, other, the other nice thing about that, apart from being a camera transition, is like feeling like you get that one last kind of shot to support yourself. You know, uh, one last chance to make things easier on yourself. Alright. I thought I couldn't move earlier, but um, probably shouldn't have just been standing there while he was giving me orders. Now we have our old friend the Javelin, which we've used in previous ones. I can't remember what happened to the gunship, I think they had to leave or something. So now we have this kind of cinematic, you know, fighting under the Eiffel Tower kind of thing. Seems to be wobbling back and forward a bit. If you saw any trailers to this game where you play, you know what's going to happen to it. Or you don't even need to, like, it's clear if you're fighting in front of the Eiffel Tower in a modern warfare, it's going to fall down. That's pretty obvious. Because why wouldn't it fall down? Oh, that was not a good place to put that smoke off. Didn't throw it as far as I thought I would. Jet just crashed into the bridge. So everything's getting quite dramatic. You meant to have this kind of sense that there's a ma much larger para um, battle for Paris happening around us while we're just kind of one part of it. You know, just one mission trying to get this guy out. I just realized I um, was on this bridge in real life earlier this year. Like, went to the. After climbing up the tower, walked along this bridge and went up that way. That's pretty unrelated. So being told to hold this position, there's a wall so we can't go any further. Uh, we're waiting for our um, to people to come and get us. You know, they're still attacking us, they're still not really letting us get away. So it's kind of got this um, last stand kind of feeling. So of course the gunship runs out of fuel. We've only got 30 seconds left until our landing gets here. Our evacuation rover. There's tanks coming and everything. So sad music comes in while we're feeling desperate. It's meant to feel like they're about to make a, um, you know, really hard decision. So you have to get clearance before they ask for a bombing run because, well, the Eiffel Tower was there. But they decided to do it. The unmanned drones come in. Smash everything. So it's kind of this ultimate destruction happening, you know, because we're desperate really. And because of the futility of war, sad music as the Eiffel Tower falls down. Quite dramatically, into the river. 
and then our helicopters fly in to save us over the top of them. It's like it's pretty corny, um, you know, the Eiffel Tower falling down, but of course the Eiffel Tower is going to fall down. I'm not going to have a super bombastic modern war without that happening. And of course as we take off we see the, the um, kind of tragic waste of it just crashed there. I think it's meant to feel like a sad sacrifice that we would get rid of the Eiffel Tower in order to get Volk, but you know, it was the Americans deciding it, not the French. So like, it wasn't really a self-sacrifice, it's like we think the French can deal with it. We got names, dates, locations. Volk gave us everything, even for Gata. It seems your hunch was right, Captain. Already making friends. So Sandman's talking to Price again, six hours from now. figuring out stuff, information from Volk. Volk. The old square. We have tier one groups assigned to handle this, but I don't think they'll make it in time. But you're close. Very. I'll contact you when it's done. Megarov's council all together in the middle of a war zone. Sounds convenient. Overconfidence makes you careless. We'll infiltrate along two separate routes, so you and Yuri head for the church and provide overwatch. The city's locked down tight. We'll need a back door. Leave that to me. So now we're heading to Prague, um, which I imagine is deep within Makarov's territory. The resistance is expecting us. Have a click. Um, we have this kind of repeat. So now we have like a whole lot of intertextuality happening here in Fat Cigar. We have the beginning of Modern Warfare 1 with Soap. Sorry, with Price smoking a cigar. And we also have the way he was smoking in that kind of position. It's just exactly how Soap smoked his cigar at the start of Modern Warfare 2 as a reference to Price smoking in Modern Warfare 1. So you had this kind of convergence of references in this single um, reference just there. And again, this is super weird. I've been to Prague since um, playing this game last. Got engaged on that bridge. That's weird. Move over the docks. The storm will keep us quiet. This is uncanny. I know exactly where I am. So I guess Prague is meant to be kind of quite deep. I imagine it was probably one of the first places to fall in this war Russia is having against Europe. So it kind of feels like you're kind of deep in their territory, in Makarov's territory. It's kind of quite horrific, you know. Bodies are just being thrown into the river. And there, helping us out of water, is Kamarov, who um, if you remember, he was the good Russian from Modern Warfare 1, who was leading the rebels against the ultra-nationalists, and now he's back to help us. Uh, this game never really mentions who he is, like, but he's someone that we've had around before. Um, but, you know, if you remember, if you were paying attention to first Modern Warfare, you know, you just kind of realize. So now we're heading under the streets of Prague to try to get in position to hopefully assassinate Makarov. And we've got two teams, Yuri and Soap here, and then Price and... I don't know who Price is with, Sandman or Nikolai? I don't think Sandman is here. Price is with somebody going somewhere else. Price and Kamarov are going together, that's what's happening. So now... You know, we're on a stealth mission with Soap in the lead, um, which is interesting, you know, you know, instead of Price. Sure, I'll take out both of them.
Uh, I have walked down the street in real life. This is bizarre. But it's so clearly there's already been a lot of fighting here before we got here, and now the city's pretty much been captured that we're trying to sneak into. Oh yeah, so here we like you got the shadows of the men heading towards us around the corner. Quite like this part. This is kind of like going through the grass in Chernobyl again in Modern Warfare 1 when we were behind Price. You know, there's bodies and mannequins and just a lot of human figures. It's so a quite a tense moment, you can feel the rumbling of the tanks outside. It works quite well, just like the um, long grass in Chernobyl, even if you're not actually control it, um, in any actual danger here. Like, you, it's not as, um, you know, there's not as much chance to screw this up as it is in the long grass in Chernobyl when you're going through the columns of men. Where you just, I don't know. And it feels less crass in a game like, say, Homefront that has you hide in a mass grave, which is just kind of gross. Oh. And apparently they see us. I think I walked. I think I walked past whatever invisible line I wasn't meant to walk past. I was probably let, meant to let Soap go first. So you kind of see the game kind of quite aggressively telling me not to step out of line. Right, because he was meant to do that sneaky kill that I was meant to watch. So you know that's the kind of thing I think a lot of people get really angry at these games for, like not letting you go ahead yourself. Well him doing that allows me to get an assault rifle for what's about to happen. Um, but you know I'm like well I was meant to be following this guy so if I followed my orders then it would have been fine. So you got to take him out and suddenly Price appears behind him and stabs him. Yeah, he's with Kamarov. I like that you got to shoot him and suddenly Price appears in your scope. Like they make sure you're looking at him. And suddenly with the lightning, all the rebels just kind of appear and make a mess of things. So I guess we decided we were close enough, you know, we weren't going to get through them without, you know, um, causing a ruckus, so we might as well cause a ruckus. Oh. 
was a useless throw. Useless shot. We gotta get out of here. Yeah, too many reinforcements. So again, like the game goes running gun, but then almost instantly stops you from doing that and gives you something else to do. And it's kind of quite grim um, civilian building, which is clearly full of people who just couldn't get out of the city in time. Like lots of wounded civilians, some rebels. I think the first time I played this game, that lady who looked out the door got shot in the head. Um, and I assumed it was scripted, but it clearly wasn't because I've never seen it happen again. No, I kind of like that the game has all its scripting, but it's still able to, you know, alter from that. So I don't think these are the Russian. Rebels like Kamarov's men, I think these are just kind of local Prague, you know, freedom fighters or whatever. Clearly outnumbered out and outgunned. And we're kind of just exploiting them really, um, to cause a mess while we get close to where we want to get to. Like we're really just sacrificing them for our own, for our own end. So we're going to get joined by more and more of our good guys with rockets flying from the roofs and whatnot. Um, so Price has kind of set this up. And then suddenly there's a wave of people just running down the street. And a tank comes the other way. And we have to get out of here because the tank's just mowing everybody down. And to make sure we get closer, we see Soap jump through the window into the art gallery. Friend James kind of wrote a piece about the kind of amusing symbolism of running through an art gallery being blown to crap in this game. You know, the way you move through an art gallery being kind of similar, you move through this game and it just wants you to look at things and then it blows it all up. Um, James already wrote something much more interesting about that, but I should probably link it under this video. Um, and we're going to go through here. This level's not afraid to just mow down civilians and people just to show us where enemies are. Um, it feels like quite a grim, dark level compared to most of the game. You know, except probably no Russian. Um, oh. Just in that way that there's just so many dead people, so many wounded people. It's a really kind of grim change of tone. Again, kind of like the torches on earlier enemies, these lasers turn off the second you kill them. Which is another kind of satisfying visual feedback that makes no sense. So we need to get close, but we don't want them to know we're close either. Now we're just laying here watching more of these um, rebel fighters get absolutely mowed down. They probably weren't even fighting before we kind of started things. I have a vehicle we're hiding behind it's rolled over by a tank. Kind of. You know, and there were more civilians hiding here as well. Get 
so again, kind of like the Chernobyl mission we've gotten to where um, we need to do the assassination and that's the end of the mission and then we have to wait there for six hours or whatever until it's actually time for Makarov to appear. And so a lot of similarities between that mission and the Chernobyl mission. We sort of Yuri following Soap instead of Price following someone else. And again, the kind of passing of time happening of a loading screen. Which vehicle will he be in? They constantly will dead for security. We won't know. And then for the first time we have Yuri talking. Um, and he seems to know a lot about Makarov, which is making Soap suspicious. Which is maybe a bit of a late um, entry into the game for that to become a thing. That probably should have become a thing sooner. But we also know that Makarov hates Yuri. So clearly they probably know each other, so it's not really a surprise for anyone. Except maybe Soap and Price. It's an interesting loading screen of that, it's more like a um, traditional cutscene as well. Rather than a, um, rather than any kind of radar debrief kind of thing. Which is, makes it rare. But we're going to leave that there, we'll actually take the assassination attempt on Makarov in the next episode. Um, so again, we saw another couple of pretty solid missions there. Um, you know, I really like that kind of moment at the end of France, if the Eiffel Tower, as corny as it is, it just kind of works well in that moment. It makes kind of that kind of saga of trying to get Volk captured last a bit longer. Um, and then this mission plays directly from that, where we got the information we needed and now we're able to do this. Um, so, I don't know, I guess they may be a little bit filler, but they're still quite solid. But anyway, we will leave that there and continue with trying to kill Makarov in the next episode.